The Election Comes by Ernest R. McKinney The Crisis, October 1920 We colored folk are again face to face with the ever-recurring dilemma of voting it straight, embarking on an uncharted sea with a new party candidate, or descending into hell with the Democrats. Only since 1912, after the indifferent treatment of us by Mr. Taft and the apostasy of Theodore Roosevelt, when he joined hands with Parker of Louisiana and refused to let us cross the plain of Esdraelon with his holy crusaders, have we begun to think that there may be other ways out of the wilderness than the path over which our fathers strode in childlike faith and in vain. Now we are trying to get our minds open to the truth and follow the facts wherever they lead, not in submission to a seared ideal, but with eyes that see, ears that hear, and feelings that have been outraged by reactionary Republicans and Negro-hating Democrats. Yet the awakening is by no means complete, for there are hosts of us who close our minds and exclaim with all the fervor of a Christian martyr, I am a Republican. My father before me was a Republican. I come of a long line of Republicans. May the line lose some of its tensile strength. Historically, these Negroes perhaps are right. In the distant past, the Republican Party was our champion. It actively wished for us equality of opportunity and protection of the law granted under the Constitution. But this is not the case now. To begin with, the party is not the same party that it was 60 years ago. Neither of the two great parties is the same as in the early days of their founding. The principles for which they stood actually made them different. Both aimed at national prosperity, but through unlike and often opposed articles of faith. Therefore, the Negro today faces not the party of the abolitionists, but bidders for votes, and men lusting for power and anxious for office because the office brings with it prestige and leadership. This change in the Republican Party has been coming for some time. After the Civil War, a mental attitude established itself everywhere among Negroes and among whites in the North who had helped forward this transformation. The whites became conscious of the fact that they had played a large part in the freeing of the Negro. They had made him a citizen, given him the ballot and office. In fact, they set aside certain positions for him, and it became a tradition that he was always to get them. Then they came to feel that for these benefactions so generously bestowed, we should be eternally in their debt, and they have never ceased to remind us of this. We are all familiar with the speeches that our white friends make in our meetings after they have been glowingly introduced by one of our leading Negroes. They appear before us as a kind of mass messiah who has delivered us from the southern Romans. The tragedy of the situation is that we have come to think as they. We feel that we owe them something that can never be paid as long as the earth stands, so great is the debt. We have never ceased to prostrate ourselves before this rock of our salvation and cry out around election time, we are coming. Then we marched to the polls, in mass formation, made one cross mark, and came away satisfied. Naturally, in time, the astute white folk realized that they were losing good white votes by standing for our rights. They saw that it wasn't necessary. We had acquired tremendous Republican momentum. So they gave their time elsewhere, in the South, for instance, the Blessed South, bulwark of the democracy, but with an occasional flicker of Republicanism. No talk of justice to the Negro could win here, however, so we were gently set aside. The Constitution was not enforced. We were lynched and disenfranchised, but were rewarded with a great deal of kindness and light near the time to elect a new president. They felt that they had us safe in the fold, and we felt that we belonged there. They, of course, lost their respect for us, for no one respects a dog that wags its tail when it is kicked. I have said that we are in a dilemma. It's something like running from the devil and jumping into the sea. Some of us no longer believe in the Republican Party, but we believe far less in the Democrats. We face a situation in which our friends are in general passivity for us, but our enemies are always violently against us. For instance, the South is consistent in its opposition to us. It is passionate and murderous in defense of its traditions of white domination and black serfdom. These traditions dominate the political life. It has pushed past the frontiers of what is lawful and just, making null and void the Constitution. Yet, the Republican North is silent. But during the coming months, this silence will be broken. The Republicans want to come into power, and they will attempt to use the same old propaganda among us. As usual, a few Negroes will be offered jobs to swing our vote in line. There will be much talk about the right of every man to happiness, liberty, and justice. 
we will be told by each candidate that he believes in a square deal for us. Many job-hunting Negroes are now climbing enthusiastically on the bandwagon. As a rule, in the past, a Negro has held such positions as the Register of the Treasury, Recorder of Deeds for the District of Columbia, and a few others. Then, to make a real impression, they give us a job or two that we had never held before. It is high time, however, that we cease to be fooled at this point. There is no more reason for a Negro always being made Register of the Treasury than there is for a white man to always be Commissioner of Pensions. When Mr. Tyler was made Auditor for the Navy Department and Mr. Lewis was appointed Assistant Attorney General, we threw our hats in the air and sang praises to our Republican captors. We forgot that we are still burned at the stake, disenfranchised, crushed to the bottom in industry, refused food when we are hungry, and crowded into the gallery when we seek amusement. Yet the beginning of an awakening has come. Let us hope that this year we will be freer men than ever before. One thing that we must surely learn to do is not to function as a racial unit politically. We have got to develop independence. Party leaders must come to know that they can never be certain how we are going to vote. We have come to the place where political organization among us is absolutely essential. Such organization must be free from taint and rule of the bosses and work for the election of Negroes to office. Also, white men, who can be depended upon to recognize us as American citizens. Our new political leaders must be different from most of those we have at present. The majority now cannot be trusted. They jump at the white man's word of command and smile at the rustle of his greenbacks. The most contemptible of these leaders is the preacher politician. He is money thirsty, and at election time, he is quietly busy at party headquarters emphasizing his prestige among his people. The young colored men must rise in their might and do away with our present venal leaders and substitute a new type in their places. The leaders of the coming regime must be sacrificing, sincere, and courageous. They must not have a price. We must check them up and repudiate them mercilessly when they jeopardize our political safety. This year, we will not be left to choose between Republicans and Democrats, for there will be in the field two other groups asking for our suffrage. I refer to the Labor Party of the United States and the Committee of 48. Plank 3 of the Committee of 48 reads as follows. Equal economic, political, and legal rights for all, irrespective of sex or color. In its Declaration of Principles, Section 3, the Labor Party says, We dedicate the Labor Party of the United States to the principle of complete political and industrial equality of the sexes and races, nationalities, and creeds. When I read the literature of the Committee of 48, I wondered if it would be another progressive party, with a Parker demanding that it would be a white man's party. I wrote to the chairman and asked him the following questions. 1. Does the Committee of 48 intend to go before the country favoring an equal chance for the Negro to vote and hold office and have the same chance in the courts and in industry as white men? 2. Do the Southern members of the committee favor this? 3. If the Southern members object to Negro equality, what do the Northern members intend to do? Mr. J.A.H. Hopkins, the chairman, replied as follows. I can perhaps answer your question, that when we declared for equal rights, we meant exactly what we said and intend to go through. In the preliminary meetings of both these parties, these equal rights measures were enthusiastically adopted, but the real test has not yet come. A political party gets into power through votes, and votes are got by political maneuvering and the spending of money. Who can say that they will stand up for and in defense of their Negro adherents when the pressure is put on? It is a fine thing that such a stand has been taken, and we may be inclined to lend our ear. But we must be careful and go slow. The time has come when Negroes must cease to grow enthusiastic about any of the things that white men say to them or about them. We must keep an open mind, and insist on deeds and not words, no matter how good they sound. All parties and candidates must know that we insist on the fullness of United States citizenship and will never be satisfied with anything less. We must have its privileges, its responsibilities, and the protection of the country's laws, North, South, East, and West. We will support the party that will give us tangible evidence that it recognizes this principle and will carry it into effect. We will not compromise, for progress for us will not come through compromise. This has been tried and has miserably failed. We must be true to ourselves and to our own. 
Then, as the election comes, let us ponder on these things, profiting by the past and the present, and fighting our way into the future with whatever weapon is needed to achieve the goal of complete American citizenship.